The kernel trick. We often use methods based on inner products. This is a definition of an inner product, and we often use this alternative notation. For example, cosine similarity is defined in terms of inner products. Similarly, logistic regression, if we define our vectors in this way, then it can be modeled using inner products. And we can generalize inner products in a clever way. We begin with the concept of a positive cone, where the open positive cone in RD, denoted RD sub plus plus, is a set of column matrices in RD with strictly positive coefficients. Recall our inner product. It has three very important properties. It's symmetric. X inner product with itself is strictly greater than zero if f x is not zero. And it's linear in the first argument. If x and y are in the positive cone, then their inner product is strictly greater than zero. An inner product space is a real vector space V with an inner product satisfying 1, 2, and 3, and 4 if E has a positive cone. So let's look at the concept of an embedding map. So if you have observations in Rn, that is N features, for D greater than N, any phi mapping Rn to the positive cone of Rd, the open positive cone, is called an embedding map. And we can define a function k of xy to be the image of x inner product with the image of y under this embedding map. Properties, it's still symmetric, and it's strictly positive because we're in the positive cone. If we have v as a linear combination of these images, for all i equals 1 to l here, then v with itself is greater than or equal to 0. So if we take this inner product and write it in terms of this sum inner product of that sum, then we get this double summation because of the linearity of the first argument of the inner product. And that has to be the double sum of CICJ times our function, k of xi, k of xj, and it has to be greater than or equal to 0. So we call this k a kernel. And this result is called Mercer's theorem. And it leads to the kernel trick. A kernel k of xy can implement a high dimensional embedding without using the actual embedding map phi. Why? Well, Mercer's theorem is actually if and only if. So k of xy is an inner product of phi of x with phi of y, where phi is some embedding map, if and only if this double summation, i equals 1 to l, j equals 1 to l, c i, c j, k of x i, x j, is greater or equal to 0. And that's for any coefficients, c1 to c l in r, and any vectors, x1 to x l in r in. The inequality is called Mercer's condition. We prove the if. We're not going to pursue the only if here. But Mercer's condition is what we use to determine when a kernel represents an inner product of these embedding maps. And it, we don't need the embedding map if we have Mercer's condition. We only need kernels that satisfy Mercer's condition. And this is called the kernel trick. A kernel is the same as embedding in a high dimension, even infinite dimensional space RD. Some commonly used kernels polynomial kernels, radial basis kernel, and the perceptron kernel. And a kernel on a vector space V is any K from V cross V to R that is positive, symmetric, and satisfies Mercer's condition. And we specifically say it's a positive definite kernel. And if it's a positive definite kernel, it's also strictly less than one, then it's a similarity positive definite kernel, such as those we use for nearest neighbors, which is why I use the capital K here. A kernel method is where inner products are replaced by kernels. For example, cosine similarity, we can then, given a positive definite kernel, do kernel cosine similarity. So how do we choose the kernel? Well, we'll focus on these kernels for now. And we have parameters, and we often use cross-validation to select the best parameters. But positive definite kernels can also be constructed. If we have k1 and k2 are positive definite kernels on a vector space v, 
then their linear combination with positive coefficients is also a positive definite kernel. And their product is a positive definite kernel. And there are many other methods to construct kernels. And choosing a kernel is analogous to feature engineering. For example, we're going to look at ridge regression. In the previous video, we took data, we got polynomial features, and we got then applied the ridge regression. But we could do the equivalent using kernel ridge regression. So let's begin by reviewing ridge regression. Our model is a linear combination of the feature variables, which itself is an inner product. Our data, the uh, feature observations are in Rn and the y sub i's are in R. But in our table, we actually have these uh, feature observations as rows, and a row is always a transpose as a column. Hence, we're going to use the transpose to indicate that we have a row. Our matrix F is therefore this uh, stack of these rows. F transpose looks like this. We want to find the best coefficient vector W, the one that minimizes, that solves this problem. Alpha is our regularization parameter. And we can rewrite that in summation form, look like this. Now we'll define C of W to be that uh, objective function. We take its derivative. Notice we have an xi, xi transpose wi minus y sub i. So we're going to factor. And notice that when we set equal to 0, the y sub i term is down front, because we had to take a negative of that summation. And we can distribute the sum. Now we can move the sum on the end to the front. And now, continuing here at the top, we can factor out the w star. And that leaves alpha times an identity matrix plus this uh, sum xi xi transpose. Therefore, our w star is this alpha i plus sum xi xi transpose, that quantity inverse, times the sum y sub i x sub i. But the sum y sub i x sub i is actually f transpose y, and this summation inside the parentheses is f transpose f. You can look at the uh, matrices there to see that. Now, we actually need f f transpose, but we have a, a nice identity. So this thing on the top, both of those simplify to f transpose plus f transpose f f transpose. And therefore, we take inverses uh, accordingly, and we get this identity. And that allows us to write w star in this form. And so we have our ridge regression problem. Our solution is f transpose times the quantity alpha i sub m plus f f transpose that quantity inverted times our y. And what we do is we let c be equal to that inverse matrix times y, and then w star is f transpose times c. And this is just the sum, i equals 1 to n, of c sub i, x sub i, where the c sub i's are the coefficients of that vector c. Remember, we're looking at our model, and to make predictions, if we're given a new observation, we'll just take this optimal w star transpose times that new observation. So this is what our predictions look like. And in summation form, they look like this. Notice that FF transpose actually is this matrix, a matrix of inner products. So ridge regression predictions. We have our data, which we use to produce this C vector. And we've got this FF transpose, which is actually going to be a matrix of inner products, as you can see here. And given a new observation, uh, we can predict y using this summation. But suppose now we replace xi by phi of xi, where phi is an embedding map. Well, then we're going to get this ff transpose, and we're going to get this prediction. And notice it's all inner products. And that means we have a positive definite kernel k of xz. So kernel ridge regression. It's where we choose our positive definite kernel, k of xz, on Rn. We calculate this matrix k on 
the data, the feature observations. Then we calculate our C's by taking alpha I sub M plus K uh, and inverting that quantity and applying it to the Y. And then given a new observation, we use a linear combination of kernels uh, of X sub I's with the new observation uh, to get our prediction. So let's look at an example. Uh, we actually looked at something like this. We had X and Y, and this is just in the XY plane, as you can see here. Uh, we actually got this from a signal by adding some noise, and this is our, we sampled a training set and a testing set. And then we looked at this using regularized multilinear regression. And we did the feature engineering by hand. What we did was we used polynomial features, and that means that our actual features look like this. And then we got a model using these polynomial features, which was a pretty good fit to the uh, actual signal. Now, we also could have used kernel logistic regression. We're still going to get a model that's a polynomial, but this time it's going to be obtained abstractly. We're going to use kernel ridge regression via a polynomial kernel. In particular, the kernel is going to look like this. And when we do that, this is our model with a polynomial kernel of degree 5. So we're doing feature engineering in the abstract. We're doing a kernel method, which is feature engineering plus algorithm. The kernel is doing the feature engineering abstractly, but not so fast. The feature engineering we've been doing by hand will still be very important, as will regularization. For example, logistic regression can be written in terms of some kernel. So let's look at an example with logistic regression as kernel logistic regression. So here is our example. We're going to look at this following data. Two classes. Class 1 is kind of this outer rim, and then this internal core is class 0. And you can see that it's not only not linear separated, it's kind of uh, got a little bit of mixing there it's in this nonlinear margin. So we're going to scale and use polynomial features. So here is the code to do that. We're going to use fourth degree polynomials. It's going to look something like that. And then we're going to use logistic regression uh, applied to our feature engineered data. And notice we get a, a perfect score. But let's look at the decision surface. Well, that really isn't what the data is suggesting. And it's only perfect because we overfit. So what we need to do is come up with something that doesn't overfit and have these weird kind of features. So the topology we're looking at, represented by the decision surface, is not that that seems to be what the data implies. It doesn't generalize to test data. So here's the test data, and you can see it's not a good prediction of the test data. Now this is for fourth degree polynomials. What about degree five? Well, that uh, we get a, another topology. And when we go to 10th degree polynomials, look at how large our weights are in magnitude. Some of them incredibly large, some of them close to zero. So an absolute value, you can see very large weights, but some very close to zero, or much closer to zero. And I'm using log scale here. That is, we're taking a large degree polynomial model or a suitable positive definite kernel, and we're creating a highly complex model. The true model, hopefully, is an approximate special case. But overfitting is not going to allow us to generalize, and it's not going to give us the true model. So we're going to regularize the coefficients in logistic regression to lower the complexity of the models by adding constraints to binary cross entropy, and hopefully we'll get our overfitter to move closer to an approximation of the true model. So let's first look at L2 regularization. Here is our uh, cross entropy for logistic regression. And we simply add a uh, regularization term. 
So notice we're using it, the form C of H of W plus a half times the norm W squared versus an alpha regularization parameter. C larger and larger corresponds to alpha closer and closer to zero. And we often do this because we get faster implementations of these algorithms. And we should be flexible. We want speed, and sometimes that means instead of an alpha in front of the regularization, we use a C in front of the objective. So here we're going to implement this. Notice our C values. And notice we're getting now less accuracy, only 99% accuracy on the training data. But is the decision surface generalizable? Well, that looks better. Uh, it does a better job on the test data. And notice that we've controlled the size of the coefficients. They're not going crazy wild and becoming very large in absolute value. So what about L1 regularization? Well, once again, we're going to have this C in front of the objective, and we're just adding this uh, one norm. And the cross entropy is convex, so some subset of the weights is going to have to be equal to zero. Uh, we'll also look at elastic net which is where we use both of these uh, regularization terms. So here we have logistic regression with L1 regularization. We're using 10th degree polynomials now. And notice that my training score is pretty good. But notice that most of my coefficients are zeros. And notice that I get this kind of a decision surface. The decision boundary, I can actually predict what the decision boundary is. Why? Well, I have to invert the initial scaling that we used. So this is the uh, correct uh, scaled version of these parameters. But then that means I can define exactly this kind of a curve. In fact, that's an ellipse. That's the uh, decision boundary. Now, we can also use elastinet we get a better score on our training, but we get a weird topology and maybe not as good a control. So combining L1 and L2 is not always the best of both worlds. I tend to use either L1 or L2, but not both at the same time. I tend to find that they kind of frustrate each other. So regularization is very important. Good models and data science depend heavily on both feature engineering and model building. Both can lead to overfitting, which often leads to poor generalization. If you pre-process, you're going to have to apply metrics. And if you engineer features, you have to regularize. So to guarantee that every aspect of a final model is informed by the data and not contrived by the modeler, we often do feature engineering abstractly by introducing a kernel version of a given method by replacing inner products with positive definite kernels. And the kernel choice is analogous to feature engineering. Doesn't eliminate the need to do feature engineering quote by hand and regularization now is even more important. But it's a welcome and quite powerful addition to the modeling methods we are developing.